This is a rather strange and fascinating case because the missing mass murderer Harry Whitecliffe was simply not known to criminal history. And the story itself is a rather interesting little bit of detection. What happened was that I received a letter from a French authoress called Françoise Debon, who said, have you ever heard of this man Harry Whitecliffe, apparently a mass sex murderer who committed suicide in a German prison um, under a different name, Lovac Bloom, he called himself. And uh, she said he'd become a famous playwright in England, had produced plays um, rather in the style of Oscar Wilde and so on. Anyway, I said, where did you get all this stuff? And it turned out that it had appeared in a book by a couple of Frenchmen called um, New Tales of Magic by a man called Louis Povels and Guy Breton. They told this extraordinary story, you see, and she said, he sounds a fascinating character, why has nobody ever written about him? Well, I passed this on to a friend, a theatrical historian, um, John Melling, and John asked um, various people in the theatre, had they ever heard of any plays by this man, Harry Wycliffe? The answer was no. He then consulted a man who knew all about crime, who has the biggest crime library in England, and the answer was again, at that particular period, <clears throat> the beginning of the 1920s, there were just no sort of Jack the Ripper type murderers around. And yet, according to the uh, book by Louis Povels, this man was first of all um, a well-known essayist in London in the early 1920s. Um, he published an interesting volume of essays which were sort of pastiches of Oscar Wilde, and uh, then deliberately refused to step out into the limelight, so it took people quite a long time to find out who he was, according to Louis Povels. What then happened was that uh, he became known, he pro uh, produced an interesting play called Similia, which went uh, all over England and made him a lot of money. And then, at this point, and when he became very famous, well known as an English eccentric, he vanished and went to Dresden. Nobody quite knew where. Uh, why? He then set up his own little press and produced very expensive books, a press called Dorian Verlag. Got himself engaged to a beautiful girl, a girl called Valley von Hammerstein, daughter of a, aristocratic parents, and uh, lived a sort of quiet, interesting life in Dresden, translating his own plays, which were once again a great success. And then, one day in October 1924, he once again disappeared. A valley searched all over Dresden for him, and couldn't find him, and then, several months later, she received a letter which had been found in the cell of a condemned man who'd actually committed suicide in Berlin. He'd apparently succeeded in opening his veins with the buckle of his belt. And the letter was from this Lovac Bloom, uh, who turned out to be her boyfriend, Harry Whitecliffe, who admitted that he had this compulsive urge to murder women, murder and then mutilate them. He said um, he only um, felt any really deep sexual pleasure when he was disemboweling women. And apparently what had happened was that the police looking for a drug trafficker had walked into the hotel room at the very moment he was about to kill a prostitute. And he'd been arrested. Anyway, that was the story according to Louis Povels and Guy Breton. And uh, the girl, Valley, went into a, a nunnery for the rest of her life and he gives the impression that in fact um, she told him, Louis Povels, the story later. Well, as I say, we looked around for any evidence of the existence of Harry Whitecliffe, not a bit. We looked for the existence of Lovac Bloom. Again, not very much, except that Povels had mentioned that Bloom said he'd been brought up in Sydney, Australia. It was obvious that he spoke perfect English. And that um, he'd run, run the press and so on in Dresden. He'd left various clues behind about himself, you see. Now, it turns out that Dorian Press, Dorian Valag in Dresden, was a press that published expensive books. And at this point, John Melling thought that he would write off to Australia and see if he could track down his man. He wrote to a famous library in Sydney, the Mitchell Library. And in fact, he got it right the first time. They wrote back, sending him this curious little extract from the Argus newspaper for the 8th of August 1922. The extract's headed, Cultured Murderer and subtitled Literary Man's Series of Crimes, and says Wilhelm Bloom, not Lovack, a man of wide culture and consider considerable literary gifts, 
whose translations of English plays have been produced in Dresden with great success, has confessed to a series of cold-blooded murders, one of which was perpetrated at the Hotel Adlon, the best-known Berlin hotel. But these were not murders of prostitutes, but murders of postmen. In those days, the postmen, when they delivered money by registered post, took the money with them in the post bag and it was worth luring one of them into your hotel room and killing him for the amount of money he was carried, carrying around. Now, the question was, how had this Wilhelm Bloom been transformed into Lovat Bloom and then Harry Whitecliffe in the Povell's book? And I think that you can begin to see exactly how this happened. This man, Wilhelm Bloom, was born in Sydney, as he said, being brought up in Sydney, apparently of a Danish mother and a German father. This is why he spoke perfect German. Like so many of these confidence tricksters and murderers, I name a number of others in this article, you know, Neville Heath, the mass murderer, Haig, the acid bath murderer, Landru, Petty, and so on, all started off as petty swindlers, just as this man Bloom was, and all graduated to murder. I think that what happened was that Bloom graduated to the murder of postmen, made himself rather a lot of money, and being, like so many of these people, an absolute fantasist, went off to Dresden and decided he would satisfy a lifelong ambition and set up this Dorian Balag expensive press. He apparently did translate English plays into German and they were a success up and down the Rhine. As though, once again, there's more than an element of truth in this, except that none of his own plays got engaged to this beautiful girl, Vali von Hammerstein, and then I think obviously what happened was that at a certain point he ran out of money and decided he'd better go back just once more and kill another postman. And actually what happened was told in the Australian newspaper clipping. He'd made an attempt to um, rob a postman armed with two revolvers in a porch in Dresden and the tenant of the house had come there just as the postman had arrived and he'd been forced to flee. And two policemen had chased him He'd um, fired at them and both revolvers had misfired and he'd been caught. And I'm pretty sure that what happened was that after he was taken to Berlin and executed there, because that's where all his murders had occurred, he became a sort of horrible legend in Dresden. Now, of course, in the last war, there was the great firebombing of Dresden, which has destroyed almost all the records. But I think there's no doubt, whatever, that Povels has got onto this rather weird story of the man who said his real name was Harry Whitecliffe, he was the son of English aristocrats and so on and so forth. And, you know, to my astonishment, John Melling has actually solved the case. On a nice calm day in 1872 in December, a ship called the Dea Gratia, sailing across the Atlantic, saw this ship drifting along, apparently out of control, the Mary Celeste. And the captain of the Dea Gratia knew um, the ship because he'd been with it in New York. He sent some men, three men, to investigate, and they found that the ship was completely empty. The odd thing about it was that apparently it had been abandoned at very, very short notice because the breakfasts on the table were sort of half eaten. The boats were missing, and this was the really obvious point of the boats were missing. It obviously meant the captain had abandoned the ship for some reason. There was also a lot of water in the ship, so at first they thought, well, maybe it encountered severe storms and this was the problem. But surely in a severe storm <laughs> you don't get into the boats and get away. And then all kinds of weird uh, tales grew up around this. It was um, finally taken along to Lisbon, um, was um, kept there for a while. The suggestion was that the crew had mutinied and murdered the captain, but that didn't seem very likely because he was known as a, an exceptionally nice and sort of fair-minded man. So finally, um, the court was forced to admit it just couldn't decide what had happened. Um, the Mary Celeste, which had always been an extremely unlucky ship, ever since it had started, its first captain had died within 48 hours of being made captain. It had been running aground and getting into trouble ever since then. And finally, within eight months, um, the Mary Celeste were, crashed onto a reef and broke up, and that was the end of it. Now, what really caused the mystery was in 1882, a newly qualified young doctor called Arthur Conan Doyle, down in South Sea, found that he got no patience, and so he sat around writing stories. One of these stories was called J. Habakkuk Jefferson's Statement, and this statement claimed to be the statement of a man who had actually been on the Mary Celeste. He changed the name from Mary to Mary, and according to this, uh, some strange black power leader had been on board the boat and had uh, led a rebellion and all the rest of it, and this was the reason everyone had disappeared.
He also claimed that the boats were still on board. And of course, this made the mystery absolutely insoluble, because if the boats were still there on board, what had happened? Now, I think that in this case, the explanation is quite straightforward. One of the things that was being carried on the Mary Celeste was large tubs of industrial alcohol. And some of these had their tops blown off. And in fact, the top of the hold had also been blown off. Now, I think what happened is quite clear. Um, as the ship moved into warmer latitudes and there'd been a tremendous storm the night before the last signature in the log, the alcohol had all been shaken up, there'd been a series of booms as the lids were blown off the barrels. The captain, who was himself a teetotaler and had never um, shipped alcohol before, was afraid the whole ship was about to blow up and had obviously said, quick, overboard. Um, incidentally, the navigation instruments were also missing from his cabin and so was the navigation log, which meant that he'd assumed that they might be forced to navigate their way if, when they got into the boats, the Mary Celeste blew up into the air. Now, I think, obviously, what happened is he made one fatal mistake. As they tumbled off the ship and into the boats, he didn't bother to secure one of the boats to the ship by cable. Now, the evidence shows that an enormous storm came up. This is why it was so full of water. Not very long afterwards, probably the first thing that happened is that the unfortunate captain saw the Mary Celeste disappearing into the distance, and they rode like mad to catch up. He'd even got his wife and small baby with him. And obviously, they simply went down in the Atlantic. Yes, this is a very interesting one, because the historical evidence is so powerful that Joan of Arc did not die when she's supposed to have died in May 1431, at the age of 19. She reappeared five years later. And the evidence for this is incredible. Um, what happened, of course, everyone knows the story of how Joan of Arc was captured by the English and tried and burned as a heretic. Several years later, Joan of Arc, apparently, or a woman who claimed to be Joan of Arc, suddenly reappeared, and uh, she went along to a joust um, at Metz. Metz was one of the places where the original Joan had been, so, you know, she was taking quite a risk because John of Metz was one of her closest companions. She was taking a risk if she was an imposter. Her two brothers heard about this and um, hastened along, and the youngest of these, called Petit Jean, galloped out onto the field where a knight in armour, who was Joan, was um, galloping around an obstacle course. There was a sort of silence, and Petit Jean demanded, Who are you? And then the knight raised her visor, and both brothers apparently gaped and said, Joan. So it does seem fairly obvious that, you know, they believed it was Joan. Now, what then happened was that Joan and her brothers and went to a place called Vaucouleur, where she spent a week, and again it was a place where Joan of Arc herself had been, and she even, uh, this was the place, in fact, where she'd started. Um, the squire, Robert de Baudricourt, was the man who, in the first place, had sent her along to see the king when she'd um, become the great leader. She then um, went on to move around and see a lot of her old companions. Um, she went to Orléans, again, you know, as you know, she'd raised the siege there as Joan of Arc, where the magistrates gave her a banquet. You know, again, seems obvious if she was an imposter, and the hundreds of people in Orléans must have known her. And then, the one really peculiar thing about this case, finally, Joan went along to see the king himself, the man she'd actually put on the throne, um, Charles. And uh, Charles interviewed her. First of all, he said nothing, which is rather strange, because, you know, if she was the genuine Joan, surely he'd have flung his arms around her, and if she wasn't, then he'd have said she's an imposter. In fact, it was only afterwards that the king said this was not the genuine Joan. Or did he say it? We don't really know. All we know is that the journal of a man who calls himself Bourgeois of Paris says that the king declared her an imposter and that she was subsequently um, tried as an imposter. There's no evidence whatsoever for this. And we also know that this man Bourgeois of Paris hated the original Joan. His journal was full of nasty things about her. So this is a very odd sort of thing because what happened next is that Joan apparently went back to her home country and visited a nearby village called Sermes, where she feasted with relations of Joan of Arc. Of course, the thing we'd really love to know is about Joan of Arc's mother, who lived for a long time after this. And yet, although we have no account of a meeting of this woman with Joan of Arc's mother, what we do know is that Joan of Arc's mother did not denounce her as an imposter. Anyway, finally, and um, this woman, after running into sort of, as usual, trouble with the church and so on, um, married, 
and apparently settle down and live quietly and happily for the rest of her life. Um, we just don't know what happened to her. She, she just, um, you know, obviously lived a normal full life and died. Um, then, finally, we know that um, Joan's mother and her brothers tried to set in train a process to prove that Joan, after all, had not been a witch and so on, because they needed to release the enormous fortune that Joan had by this time. Um, and, of course, what they were really saying, in a way, was Joan did die at the stake. And the brother, Petit Jean, who had accepted this Dame des Amois, as they called her, as his sister, was one of those who signed the petition. And, of course, the petition was finally successful. They got the money back, and in due course, Joan of Arc was made a saint. What we seem to have here is a curious case of deliberate suppression, of records with all kinds of things suppressed. And the one thing that's absolutely clear is that if this woman was an imposter, then hundreds of people would have said so, and absolutely nobody at the time did. Strange case. Well, as you know, the great mystery here is precisely why a man would have been kept in prison, as this man apparently was, a subject of Louis XIV of France in an iron mask. In fact, um, we know now that the mask was not iron. They called it an iron mask because when it was first described by Voltaire, um, about half a century after the death of the man in the iron mask, Voltaire said that the mask that covered his face completely had sort of steel springs around the chin so that he could eat without removing the mask. He'd been told that if he removed the mask, he would be killed instantly. And all the governors and the who were in charge of him at various times, and his doctors were not allowed to see his face. The man finally died in 1703 in the Bastille. He was buried very quickly, and he was buried under the name of Marcioli. And um, that is all that was known about him until Voltaire came out half a century later and claimed that he had the solution to all this. In fact, this man, he said, the man in the Iron Mask, was really the elder brother of the king, Louis XIV, and this was the reason that he was a danger, because first of all, he resembled his brother, and secondly, of course, he should have been king if he was the older brother. But, in fact, according to Voltaire, what had happened was that um, the previous king, Louis XIII, was impotent. His queen, Anne of Austria, was sort of a lady who was known to have a kind of roving eye, and was almost certainly um, the mistress of um, the king's chief advisor, Cardinal Mazarin. Now, according to Voltaire, Mazarin had fathered the Man in the Iron Mask, on Anne of Austria, way before Louis XIV came along, and so in due course he was forced to fling him into jail. Anyway, the story caused a tremendous sensation, but of course, and this was in the age when there were still kings of France, and uh, nobody dared say very much about it. Then, after the French Revolution, when the records were finally available, they were really searched absolutely thoroughly. And immediately this interesting theory had to go out of the window. I mean, there was just absolutely not one shred of evidence in the Bastille records that Anne of Austria had ever had a child and so on. Then, of course, Dumas wrote his famous novel, The Man in the Iron Mask. This caused an even greater sensation. Um, according to Dumas, um, The Man in the Iron Mask was one of two twins. He was actually the younger twin of Louis XIV. He'd been born a few hours later, and because they were afraid there'd be complications in, you know, about being the heir to the throne, They'd simply kept one of the twins very quiet, and in due course, Louis got so alarmed that he had him um, sort of put into jail in the Iron Mask for the rest of his life. This also um, proved to be nonsense when they studied the Bastille records. And then finally, studying the Bastille records, someone actually found out who the man in the Iron Mask was. They actually found letters from the king that gave his name, and his name was Eustache Doge. This baffled everybody because nobody had ever heard of a Eustache Doge. And then historians really settled down, and they finally did manage to track down a Eustace Doge. They found out, first of all, that there'd been um, a man um, called um, Francoise um, Doge, who had been, in fact, a fairly influential person um, in the guard of Cardinal Richelieu. They discovered that he had um, several sons, one of whom was this awful scapegrace, Eustache, and another of whom was a very respectable type, um, called Louis, who in fact um, became one of the chief advisers of Louis XIV, which sounds a bit odd, because why would Louis put the elder brother Eustache in jail and sort of, st if there was some terrible secret, it'd be known to both brothers, surely, you see. Anyway, the explanation has, I think, very gradually emerged, although most scholars don't accept it. 
Eustache, we know, was sort of an absolute scapegrace. We also know that at a certain point his brother Louis also got himself into fairly deep trouble with the king and was thrown into jail himself. Now, this interesting question about the birth of Louis XIV, this is one of the great historical mysteries. I mean, if Louis XIII was really impotent, how did he manage to get a son in the first place? Well, um, the story is that it had been arranged by Richelieu that one night after the Queen Anne of Austria had separated from the king, the king took refuge in her house during a thunderstorm, spent the night with her, and as a result, Louis XIV, the heir to the throne who was so badly wanted, finally appeared. Now, almost certainly, what actually happened was that Anne of Austria had produced an heir to the throne, but the father was not Louis XIII. Um, in fact, a rather interesting clue to all this was given by this man Henry Lincoln, who was one of the chief authors of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. And what um, Lincoln states is, according to both contemporary and later writers, the child's true father was Cardinal Richelieu, or perhaps a stud employed by Richelieu. Who would the stud be? Who except the beautiful, handsome young captain of the Musketeers, Francoise Doge de Cavois, Eustache's father? And so, in a certain sense, if this story is true, and I, I'm pretty certain it is, then in fact, in a certain sense, Louis XIV was the brother of the man in the Iron Mask. You can see, there's no reason whatever why you should keep a man in jail for life with a mask over his face unless you want to hide his face. And the only one reason to hide his face is, A, either he's very famous and would be recognised and no such person disappeared in Europe during this period, or he looked so much like somebody else, the king, that there was good reason to keep him there. Almost certainly what happened is that when his brother was thrown into jail, Eustache Doge began to put pressure on the king, blackmailing him, saying, look, saying, look, I shall expose this fact, that in fact your father was not Louis XIII, but was the same person as my father. And that the king at this point grabbed him, put him into jail, and of course his rather nice younger brother Louis, as I say, remained a, one of the ministers of the king for the rest of his life. He was quite harmless, he had no intention of betraying the secret. There's only one sort of odd little postscript to that whole story. When Louis XV was finally told the secret of the man in the iron mask by the regent, the Duke d'Orléans, he's reported to have said, oh, if he was still alive, I'd give him his freedom. Now, would he in fact have given freedom to a man who could blow the fact that the whole line of kings was not genuine and that Louis XIII was not the real father? So, you know, there's still this great big question mark that hands over it. But I think in all probability, the Doge solution is the true one. This is a story that's so strange that I think most people would say that the whole thing is complete and nonsensical superstition. This story took place in a little parish churchyard called saint Medard between 1727 and five years later, 1732. And it sounds just so preposterous that you, you dismiss it as pure invention. In fact, it's so well authenticated that there's just no doubt whatever that the descriptions are absolutely precise and accurate. Well, it all began um, with the burial of the deacon of Paris in May 1927, a man called Francois de Paris, um, who was revered as a holy man with powers of healing. Now, he was a follower of a man called Bishop Cornelius Janssen, um, who taught that um, men can be saved only by divine grace. And these Jansenists were hated um, by the Jesuits, who were their most powerful rivals. Well, great crowds followed the coffin of the deacon of Paris. He was laid in a tomb behind the high altar at saint Medard. The congregation filed past, laying flowers on the coffin. A father supported his son, who was a cripple, leaning over the coffin, when suddenly the child went into convulsions, seemed to be having a fit, and as people helped to drag him writhing to a quiet corner of the church, the convulsion stopped. He opened his eyes, then slowly stood up. And a look of joy crossed his face, and to the astonishment of everybody, he began to dance up and down, singing and laughing. Well, of course, this um, went all over Paris. The boy's withered right leg was found to be, uh, to be just as strong as his um, left leg. It was um, claimed that the withering had disappeared completely from the muscles. Well, within hours, there were cripples, lepers, hunchbacks, blind men, all rushing into the church. Now, as these stories of miraculous cures spread, because they were cured, um, the 
respectable people of Paris said, oh, this is another one of these sort of, you know, obsessions of the, the working class and so on. They didn't believe it for a moment. Deformed limbs were supposed to be straightened, hideous growths and cancers disappearing, sores and wounds healing. The Jesuits, of course, said the whole thing was either a fraud or the work of the devil. Now, one of these people who actually went and looked and investigated was a lawyer named um, Louis Adrien de Page. And when he told his friend, a magistrate, who was called um, Louis Basile Carré de Montgeron, about this, and what he'd seen there, the magistrate assured him patronising that he'd just been taken in by a lot of conjuring tricks, the kind of miracles performed by tricksters at fairgrounds. But he agreed to go along with Page um, to the churchyard, if only for the pleasure of pointing out how the lawyers had all been deceived. So they went there on the morning of the 7th of, 7th of um, September, 1731. Well, when Montgeron left the churchyard that day, he was a totally changed man. And he even endured prison rather than deny what he'd seen that day. Now, he tells us in a book he wrote about it that the first thing he saw was a number of women riding on the ground, twisting themselves into the most hideous shapes, bending backwards until the backs of their heads touched the heels. They were all wearing a kind of long underwear fastened around their ankles because apparently prurient young men used to go along when it first began to happen to peer up the young ladies' skirts. But um, the whole place was writhing with these people. And what's more... Um, People were lying around on the ground, being apparently sadistically beaten with heavy pieces of wood and iron. Um, other women were being crushed under immensely heavy weights. One girl was naked to the waist and a man was gripping her nipples with a pair of iron tongues and twisting them as violently as he could. And Page explained that none of these women felt any pain. On the contrary, and many begged for more blows. In another part of the churchyard, they saw an attractive pink cheeked girl of about 19 who was sitting on a trestle and eating food. That seemed normal enough until Mangeron looked and saw the food um, was actually human excrement and that between mouthfuls of this she was drinking a yellow liquid that was urine. She'd come to the churchyard to be cured of what we'd now call neurosis. Um, she'd used to wash her hands hundreds of times a day and was so fastidious about food she'd taste nothing. <laughs> the deacon had cured her and now, you know, as a sort of tribute to the deacon, she was eating excrement and drinking urine with every sign of enjoyment. And after staggering away from this, Mangeron um, came to a part of the churchyard where women had volunteered to cleanse suppurating wounds and boils by sucking them clean. While trying hard to stop himself from vomiting, he watched as somebody unwound a dirty old bandage from the leg of a small girl. The smell was so horrible that he recoiled. He said the leg was a festering mass of sores, so deep the bone was visible. And the woman who'd volunteered to clean it, one of these convulsionaires, they called them, the women who went into convulsions, she'd been miraculously cured, and so now to demonstrate how easy it was to overcome any human feeling, um, she bent down and proceeded to suck the gangrened leg and then um, sucked it absolutely clean. And finally they bound up the leg and um, Mangeron was told that the girl would pretty certainly be completely cured. Now, what he finally saw completely shattered him and convinced him that this was a real miracle, not just, you know, nutty people who could do these horrible things. A 16-year-old girl named Gabrielle Molay had arrived and everyone was gathered around because she was obviously a celebrity. She removed the cloak and lay down on the ground, her skirt modestly around her ankles, and four men, each holding a pointed iron bar, stood over her. When the girl smiled at them, they lunged down at her, driving their rods into her stomach. Mongeron tried to rush forward and had to be grabbed. He looked for signs of blood, but none came, and the girl looked perfectly calm and serene. Next, the bars were jammed under her chin, forcing her head back. It seemed inevitable to penetrate through to her mouth, yet when the points were removed, the flesh was unbroken. Mongeron watched the girl being beaten with a great iron truncheon shaped like a pestle. Then a stone weighing half a hundred weight was raised above her body and dropped repeatedly from a height of several feet. And finally, he watched her kneel in front of a blazing fire and plunge her head into it. He could feel the heat from where he stood, yet her hair and eyebrows weren't even singed. And when she picked up a blazing chunk of coal and proceeded to eat it, Mangeron could stand no more and he left. Well, he went back repeatedly until he had enough material um, for uh, the first volume of a book which he presented to King Louis XV, who was so shocked and indignant that he had Mangeron thrown into prison. Yet Mangeron felt that he had to bear witness, and he went on and published two more volumes. And the year following, um, 1732, the authorities decided the scandal was becoming so unbearable they closed down the churchyard, and the various convulsionaires um, who found they could perform the miracles anywhere continued for many years.
a hardened sceptic, a scientist called La Condamine, was just as startled as Mongeron when in 1759 he watched a girl named Sister Francoise being crucified on a wooden cross nailed by her hands and feet over a period of several hours and stabbed in the side with a spear. It obviously hurt the girl and the wounds bled when the nails were removed, but she just seemed absolutely none the worse for the ordeal afterwards. So, it happened. There's just no doubt whatever there are just too many witnesses for the thing to have been a fraud. There's no explanation, and we don't really believe that um, it was necessary the, the spirit of the holy deacon that did it. But, you know, what was it? Just impossible to say. This one's a very strange little story, and also pretty well unknown. It begins really at the 27th annual general meeting of the Cairngorm Club in Aberdeen, when an eminent mountaineer, Professor Norman Colley, suddenly told how, um, in 1890, 35 years before, he'd been climbing alone on a mountain called Ben Macdui, 4,000 feet above sea level in the Cairngorms of Scotland, and as he was returning from the plateau, there was a heavy mist and he heard crunching noises behind him. He said as if somebody was walking after him, but taking three or four steps, three or four times the length of my own. And he said it was nonsense and walked on. But as the footsteps continued to sound behind him, he said, I was seized with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles. Now, it sounds obviously as if um, he was slightly hysterical. And yet, in fact... There's so much evidence from other people that there is something rather strange on Ben McDewey that um, it does present a very interesting mystery. Uh, some of the accounts make it sound as if what we're dealing with is in fact something rather like the famous abominable snowman. Uh, for example, um, one man, uh, a man called... Um, Frere decided to set up his tent on the top of Ben McDewey to win a bet. And uh, he set it up by a cairn on the summit. Now, he began to, he said, experience a curious dreamlike sense of unreality. Now, that happens again and again with people on Ben McDewey. Um, uh, Frere said um, he didn't feel in any way mad, but it was just that a curious kind of terror, a nightmare terror, began to possess him. And he felt as if um, he was going to learn something that would absolutely shatter him. Uh, he said he fell asleep, and when he woke up, there was moonlight coming through the fly sheet of the tent. As he stirred, stirred, he saw a brown blur and knew that there was something between himself and the moon. Finally, he crept, peered through the crack, and he said the night was brilliant, and about 20 yards away, a great brown creature was swaggering down the hill. And he said his impression was the creature was about 20 feet high and covered with shortish brown hair. He said it was too erect to be a huge ape. It had a tapering waist and very broad shoulders. Now, there is a book on the grey man of Ben McDewey um, by a man called Athlet Grey, which actually contains photographs. And it contains footprints found there on the summit. And they look exactly like the footprints of the abominable snowman um, discovered on the Menlong Glacier of Everest by Eric Shipton in 1951. Now, it sounds as if, then, we're dealing with some kind of humanoid creature. And yet, um, the evidence is very much against this. For example, a woman called Wendy Wood um, described in her book, The Secret of Spey, how she'd um, reached the pass of Larry Gru um, near Ben McDewey on a slowy day and was preparing to return when she heard, she said, a voice of gigantic resonance close behind her. She said she, it seemed to speak with harsh consonants and the full vowel sounds of Gaelic. And she wondered if somebody was lying injured in the snow, so she tramped around in circles. And then, suddenly feeling afraid, once again, this curious terror, she began to hurry back. And as she descended the mountain, she thought she could hear footsteps following her. She had a strange feeling that something walked immediately behind her. At first she thought it might be the echoes of her own footsteps, until she realised the crunching noises did not exactly correspond with her steps. And once again, you know, she reached the bottom quite safely. Nobody actually ever seems to have been harmed um, by this thing, whatever it is. Now, on another occasion, a man called Densham was on the mountain, um, again with Richard Frere, searching, this was during the war, they were searching for an aeroplane that was reported to have crashed. They were sitting close to the cairn when Densham was surprised to hear Frere apparently talking to himself on the other side of the cairn, which, as you know, is a heap of stones. Then he realised that Frere was talking to someone else. 
And he says, I went round and found myself joining in a conversation. It was a strange experience which seemed to have a psychic aspect. We talked to someone invisible for some time, and it seemed that we carried on this conversation for some little time until we suddenly realised there was nobody there but ourselves. So, again, you've got this strange business for a dreamlike sensation, which seems to overtake people on Ben McDewey. This kind of thing does seem to happen again and again in association with peculiar psychic events. And, for example, those two English ladies at Versailles in the early part of the century, who thought that they'd stepped back into the century of Marie Antoinette, said once again that they had this strange, feverish, dreamlike sensation that went on throughout the whole experience. It's almost as if you've fallen through into another dimension. Um, the um, novelist Joan Grant, who says that she um, you know, lived a number of past lives, had a similar sort of sensation actually down below um, in the village of Avi Moor. And she said something utterly maligned, four-legged and yet obscenely human, invisible and yet solid enough for me to hear the pounding of its hooves, was trying to reach me. And if it did, I should die, for I was far too frightened to know how to defend myself. And she says she fled in terror and ran for half a mile before she burst through a kind of barrier and suddenly everything was OK. Again, you see, you can say just pure imagination. And yet again and again, these things seem to happen in the same area. Um... One of the oddest was um, a Captain Sir Hugh Rankin and his wife, um, who were marching through a pass very close um, to Ben McDewey, when they say they saw an olive-complexioned man dressed in a long robe and sandals, and they said, being Buddhists, we at once knew who it was. They knew it was one of the great masters. Now, obviously, they claim that they had a conversation with him. This sounds absurd. You think, oh, you know, religious cranks and so on. Now, what I would suggest is that it's something a little more complex than that. What you've got is some strange force in the ground itself. Um, I've spoken about Lawrence van der Post and his comments about um, Africa in a book called The Lost World of the Kalah Kalahari. He tells how, when he was looking for the vanished bushmen of South Africa, his guide took him to a place called the Slippery Hills and said that there must be no hunting on any account or the spirits would be angry. Unfortunately, somebody in Van der Post's party um, actually shot a warthog as they approached, and he says from then on they just ran into endless trouble, endless bad luck. He says everything went wrong, and he said when the guide tried to pray, Van der Post actually saw him grabbed and thrown backwards by some unseen force, and finally the guide succeeded in consulting the spirits, as he said, and they told him that they would have killed him if he tried to pray again and that they were angry about the shooting of the warthog. Van der Post then suggested they should all write a, a message of apology, and it should be buried in a bottle at the foot of a sacred rock, and this seemed to work. He says they suddenly got a feeling as if a tremendously powerful atmosphere had lifted, and he says, and through the guide, the spirits told Van der Post that next time, the next place he got to, he'd find bad news waiting for him, and in fact this proved to be true. He heard that his father was dead. It does seem to me, you see, that there are places that still have some force which the ancients called elementals in the ground itself. Uh, a more modern theory would be that these are just so-called ley lines, some tremendous magnetic force in the earth that seems to cause certain places to record powerful human emotions. And again, this seems to me to be a possi possibility about Ben McDewey. One thing that's absolutely certain is that there's something very strange there. This is one of the oddest unsolved mysteries, I suppose, of all time. What happened was that on Whit Monday, 1828, 26th of May, in Nuremberg, uh, the square was almost empty, and at about five in the afternoon, a weary-looking youth came dragging himself into the square, um, his feet actually bloody, and almost fell into the arms of a local cobbler. When the local cobbler said, Who are you? Um, he did not appear to understand, and replied in grunts, the cobbler assumed that he was either drunk or that he was an idiot. But the boy then took out a, um, a letter and handed it to him, and um, the letter, um, apparently, was to the captain of the local guard. When it was opened, it proved to contain two letters. Um, the first said um, that um, the author was a peasant who had brought up this boy, who now wished to serve the king in the army. He said he'd been brought to me whoever me was, on October the 7th, 18, 1812, I'm only a poor labourer. His mother asked me to bring him up, and since then, um, you know, I've um, looked after him, but I'm sending him along to you. The second letter was apparently a letter from the boy's mother originally, 12 years earlier, 
when they were saying um, she'd, um, she was pregnant, she couldn't look after the baby, and would this peasant bring her up? Um, well, as soon as the letters were inspected, they found they were obviously written by the same hand, and the whole thing was obviously a fraud. But what was mysterious was that um, the boy had extremely pale skin, as if he'd been kept in darkness, but as I say, his feet were bloody, and he'd only walked a fairly short distance. Well, he was locked in a cell, and soon he was a local sensation. It was obvious that he could just say one or two things. Um, for example, he knew the word for horse. Um, he knew the words for I don't know. And um, he also um, he was applied the same word, um, junger, um, meaning boys, to men and women. And he obviously just knew nothing whatever. When they put food in front of him, um, he obviously didn't know what to do with it until they just put ordinary black bread and then water. And then he made a ravenous meal seeming to prove that he'd only ever been fed on black bread and water. He performed his natural physical functions completely openly and happily in front of the crowd who'd come to see him. Obviously he had no modesty at all. Anyway, of course, he became a sensation. He was a strange-looking youth, sort of looked like an idiot, coarse, lumpish, clumsy, and sort of rather repulsive. The backs of his knees had bumps on so that when he sat on the ground, the whole of his leg touched the ground. And yet... Um, he very quickly began to show that he was extremely intelligent. He learned language in a fairly short time, and as soon as he was able to speak, he told this extraordinary story, that for as long as he could remember, he'd lived in a tiny room about seven feet long by four feet wide, with boarded-up windows, no bed, just a bundle of straw on the bare earth, and a low ceiling so that he couldn't stand upright. And he said he never saw anyone. When he woke up, he'd find bread and water in his cell, and he said sometimes the water had a bitter taste and he'd go into a deep sleep. And when he woke, his straw would have been changed and his hair and nails had been cut. His only toy was a wooden horse, and this is why he was so enthusiastic about horses. And he says that one day a man had come into his room and taught him to write his name, Caspar Hauser, this was one more thing that he could do, and to repeat phrases like, I want to be a soldier and don't know. And then another day he woke up to find himself wearing strange baggy clothes in which he'd been found, and the man led him into the open air, made him trudge for a long distance, and then abandoned him near the gates of Nuremberg. So, of course, tremendous question. Why? Why had the poor child been brought up in total darkness? Um, moreover, it was fascinating that the total darkness seemed to have given him a very peculiar kind of sensitivity. Um, he, he'd vomit if coffee or beer was even in the same room. He could smell it from the most distant corner. The, the sight of meat produced nausea. The smell of wine literally made him drunk. And his eyesight was so abnormally acute that he could actually see in the dark and would often demonstrate reading the Bible in a completely black room. And he was also so sensitive to magnets, he could tell whether the North or South Pole was pointed towards him. And he could distinguish different metals, even if you covered them over with a cloth or something, just by passing his hand over them. I think that's very interesting evidence that when a person is kept in complete sensory deprivation, they develop some other faculties. Anyway, he was handed over to a sort of schoolmaster and scientist named George Friedrich Dalma, um, who um, took him under his wing. Dalma was a little disappointed when he found that although Caspar seemed to be a quite intelligent youth, um, he also seemed to have defects of character. Um, he was a bit of a liar, um, and also, you know, he was obviously immensely flattered by the attention. Now, if you reckon on the fact that really, in a certain sense, this boy, who was um, 16 was really um, only six months old in the sense of knowing people. You, it's not particularly surprising that he was, you know, really in some ways rather a, a sort of innocent and um, irritating character. Anyway, the chief theory that was aired, particularly by a German criminologist called von Feuerbach, was that Caspar must be someone of royal blood who had been deliberately kept under these circumstances uh, because it would have been a tremendous embarrassment to his family. Um, Another um, a group uh, believed that he was connected with the Royal House of Baden, and there was some absurd theory about the Royal House and so on, and uh, how some wicked mother had deliberately tried to kill off the um, children of the old Duke when she'd married him. But obviously she would have had to snatch Casper away when he was a tiny baby and hand him over to, um, to a midwife or whatever you're saying. It's just, just a completely unlikely theory. Anyway, what happened was that finally a wealthy and eccentric Englishman um, came along and offered um, to take over Casper and actually took him all over Europe to various courts where he was, you know, a tremendous sensation. But before that, there had been one very strange event. 
um, somebody had apparently tried to kill Casper. He said he was in the basement um, at the house of his teacher, George Friedrich Nama, um, when somebody broke down into the cellar, um, hit him um, with a knife on the head, and then left him lying there. He said it was a man wearing a silk mask. It was a very sort of odd story, because, I mean, you know, if the chap had gone down there with a knife to kill him, why did he hit him on the head with it and uh, just knock him down on the floor? Above all, why did he then go away without touching him further? It all sounded very strange. Anyway, um, the uh, kind Englishman, Lord Stanhope, finally got rather fed up with Casper himself. He found him a sort of, uh, like many people, an oddly irritating sort of person, uh, vain, um, conceited, although, you know, rather a sweet, nice nature. And so he finally dumped him in a town close to Nuremberg called Ansbach, and Caspar almost died of boredom in this place. He really hated it. Anyway, a few days um, before Christmas 1833, once again, apparently, an attack on Caspar. Um, he came staggering into the house of the man with whom he was staying, a man called Meyer, um, staggering and saying, um, man, stabbed, knife, Hofgarten, and so on, go look quickly. So a doctor discovered that Casper had been stabbed in the side just below the ribs and that the blow had damaged his lungs and liver. And a man called Hickel, who was a kind of guard, rushed along to the park, um, which was covered with snow, and found that there was a silk purse containing a note written in mirror writing, you know, written by someone with the left hand holding it up to a mirror which said, Hauser will be able to tell you how I look, whence I come and who I am. To spare him, <clears throat> I will tell you myself, I am from Dash on the Bavarian border. My name, and then he put his initials, M-L-O. Anyway, it all seemed very peculiar. What was even more peculiar was that Caspers were the only footsteps in the snow. Two days later, Casper died, December the 17th. Slipped to in, into a coma, and his la last words were, I didn't do it myself. Now again, sort of all Europe was shattered by this. They thought, you know, a horrible crime had been committed. This was evidence that, in fact, you know, Casper really was a member of some royal family and that there was a dark secret in his background. I must admit that I'm inclined to disbelieve that. In Cornwall, um, where I live, we had an interesting case a few years ago, an army deserter of the First World War who, when he came back home, was kept concealed in his family's farmhouse for 30 years. I mean, that just doesn't make sense, because if he'd been arrested, they'd have given a few, few months in jail. It seems to me that what we're dealing with here, in other words, is the stupidity of peasants, um, rather than the royal family. I think that probably what really happened was that um, Casper was the illegitimate child of some respectable farmer's daughter, and she was engaged to a local landowner or something and, you know, eventually married him, and it was important that nobody should realise that she'd had a child, and that they therefore kept Casper in the dark completely until they packed him off to Nuremberg. In which case, what about the attacks? Now, it's interesting that people had begun to lose interest in Casper, and then um, Casper published a book... Um, written by himself and Dalma, his autobiography, which was a total flop. You know, people said, oh, so what, we know all this. And uh, Casper's hope of, you know, once again attracting public attention vanished. I think that explains that first attack in the cellar. I think Casper did it himself. And I think that if that is so, then it's almost certain that Casper attacked himself the second time. He went out into the park with a knife, determined he would give himself a sort of slight wound of some sort. He was completely desperate, agonisingly bored, badly needed to be the centre of attention, and that he wounded himself, and unfortunately wounded himself too deeply, um, pierced his liver, and died as a consequence. If so, of course, he at least achieved what he wanted, universal sympathy in a place in the history books. <laughs>